Welcome to the Tobacco Online P Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Catherine McLean, a tobacco control researcher at Temple University. TOPS is organized by myself, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, C. Shang from The Ohio State University, and Mike Pesco from Georgia State University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the, top, the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, in, to introduce our speaker. Today we conclude our winter 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. Aaron Phillips entitled Cigarettes Smoked Following CVS's, CVS Health's Tobacco-Free po Pharmacy Policy. Aaron Phillips is a health services researcher interested in the use of alcohol and other substances among adults with chronic conditions, particularly older adults. Her research investigates the determinants of alcohol use and misuse among this population, its role in the natural history and management of chronic conditions, and policy and clinical approaches to improve outcomes. She's currently a postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, having received her PhD in health policy from the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health and MPH from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Our discussion today is Dr. C. Shang. Dr. Phillips, thank you for presenting for us today. Great, thank you, Justin, so much for the introduction and uh, to TOPS for uh, inviting me to present today. I'm gonna uh, share the slides and go ahead and get started. All right, um, so as Justin mentioned, this is work looking at cigarettes smoked following CVS Health's tobacco-free pharmacy policy. I first uh, certainly want to thank my co-authors on this work, uh, Dr. Jennifer Aher and Dr. William Kerr and Dr. Hector Rodriguez uh, from UC Berkeley School of Public Health and the Alcohol Research Group, whose work was really integral to this project. I also want to thank the funding, um, acknowledge the funding from NIAAA and say thank you to Blue Cross Blue Shield Association who provided some of the data for this analysis. And uh, other than that, we have no disclosures. So as I'm sure many of you remember, in February 2014, CVS announced that they would no longer be selling tobacco products in their pharmacies, claiming that the sale of tobacco was inconsistent with their company's purpose to help people on their path to better health. And the policy was implemented in September of that year, um, and as a result, tobacco products were removed from all of their locations at that time, uh, numbering over 7,000 stores across 44 states. And while several local jurisdictions in Massachusetts and California had previously banned the sale of tobacco in pharmacies, this policy was the first to be undertaken by a corporate pharmacy chain and, and that occurred nationally. So this picture, you know, shows what pharmacies looked like prior to the removal of cigarettes from um, from the pharmacies, you see the cigarettes on display right here behind the checkout counter uh, in these displays that we often call power walls. And this picture shows what CVS uh, checkout counters looked like after the policy went into effect. You see the cigarettes are gone and, and have been replaced with messaging about quitting. We just wanted to take a minute to talk about the potential of pharmacies as settings for intervention to reduce tobacco use. Pharmacies are, of course, just one of many venues in which cigarettes are available for purchase in the U.S., and they make up a small percentage of total U.S. cigarette sales, um, which is what you're seeing in this graphic here. The majority of sales are in convenience stores, and different estimates from different sources put the percentage of sales that occur in pharmacies at between 3 and 5 percent of total cigarette sales. But evidence suggests that sales in pharmacies have been increasing over time, even while national cigarette sales have been decreasing. And literature also suggests that on average, tobacco products are cheaper in pharmacies than they are in other tobacco retailers, and that pharmacies have more promotions for cigarettes than do other retailers. 
So they're certainly still attracting sales and, and might be contributing to inequities in smoking by, by offering lower priced cigarettes. So certainly a venue in which interventions might be useful. And some recent survey work suggests that about two thirds of US adults support prohibiting tobacco sales in pharmacies. So we were curious, of course, as to how this intervention might have impacted smoking. And theoretically, there were a couple mechanisms uh, through which we thought this might have happened. For one, the removal of tobacco products might have reduced impulse purchases by smokers visiting CVS to purchase other things. Impulse purchases of cigarettes are relatively common. Surveys of various populations have you know, estimated that between 11 and 30 percent of cigarette purchases are unplanned, and these estimates are based on self-reports, so likely to be underestimates. Impulse purchases can be spurred by seeing a product on display as visual cues can prompt a desire for a product and the choice to purchase it. Um, several experimental studies have demonstrated that this happens specifically with regards to cigarettes, that cigarette-related visual cues induce cravings in comparison to neutral visual cues, and it's also been reported on in surveys among current smokers. So power walls and tobacco sales at pharmacies prevent, uh, present smokers who might be visiting to purchase other things with, with pretty strong visual cues to purchase cigarettes at checkout. So likely, of course, that their removal resulted in fewer impulse purchases among pharmacy shoppers in areas where CVS makes up a large portion of the pharmacy market. And we see evidence suggestive of this from evaluations of point of sale display bans in Canada and Australia. These bans require that stores selling cigarettes keep them out of sight of customers and evaluations of these uh, policies have um, been associated, found that the bans were associated with decreases in reported spontaneous cigarette purchasing. Second, the policy change might have shifted social norms to be more against smoking. You know, widespread presence of cigarettes can be seen as an indicator that they're popular, accepted, normal products, which is a concept known as the perceived popularity effect. Um, and cigarettes' presence in pharmacies might have been particularly powerful in supporting their normativity, considering pharmacies sell otherwise health-promoting goods. So, of course, the removal of cigarettes from pharmacies might decrease some of their perceived normativity. And we've seen evidence uh, of this happening, again, following point-of-sale display bans, where uh, surveys of respondents, um, in surveys, respondents report uh, feeling uh, decreased perceptions of cigarettes' normativity and increased perceptions about their harmfulness following the implementation of these bans. We also thought it was likely that the policy change impacted daily versus non-daily smokers differently. A lot of psychology and addiction literature suggests that non-daily smokers are more likely to make impulse purchases than daily smokers because their smoking cravings are more strongly related to cues. Essentially, everyone experiences cravings as a result of cues, but daily smokers generally experience consistent, moderate cravings to smoke throughout the day. So their cravings can really only marginally be affected by additional cues. But daily smokers have fewer cravings in between smoking, so cues have more power to generate cravings and prompt impulse purchases. And there were a few other studies on this policy change that came out around and during the time we were working on some of this, and both found some evidence of an effect in particular subgroups. So one study identified that after the policy change, CVS exclusive cigarette purchasers were more likely to stop purchasing cigarettes in the following six months compared to those who never purchased cigarettes at CVS. And the second study found that urban smokers in the highest quartile of CVS density had higher probabilities of making a quit attempt after the policy change compared to urban smokers in counties with no CVS locations. Uh, so these studies uh, focused on you know, total ceasing of cigarette purchases or quit attempts, which were you know, really major behavior modifications. And we thought there might be more impacts on other smoking behaviors, like the number of cigarettes smoked per day, even among those people who did not plan to quit or cut back in the near future. And this was informed by the trans theoretical model of behavior change, which I'm sure is very familiar to a lot of people attending this uh, seminar, but you know, suggests behavior change occurs in five stages, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. And a quit attempt requires that an individual be in the preparation stage. Um, but it's estimated that only about 20% of current smokers are in this stage at any given time. 
but reductions in impulse purchases and, and social sanctioning might still impact the number of cigarettes smoked by individuals in the pre-contemplation and contemplation stages in addition to those in the preparation stage. So with all that, our objective was to assess the impact of the tobacco-free pharmacy policy on the number of cigarettes smoked per day uh, by daily smokers and by non-daily smokers. And then I'll get into the methods. So most of the data for this came from the tobacco use supplement to the current population survey, which I know is a, a data source many people are familiar with, but is a nationally representative supplemental survey administered every three to four years in conjunction with the current population survey. And we use data from the 20, uh, 2014 to 2015 survey, which was administered at three time points that straddled the CVS policy implementation. So the first wave was in July 2014, prior to the removal of cigarettes in September, and then January and May 2015. And data on pharmacies came from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Community Management Hub, which is a like a semi like Google Maps based application containing county level information on physical and socioeconomic characteristics of counties. And uh, under a data use agreement, they were able to provide us with counts of CVS pharmacies, as well as other corporate pharmacies and the total number of pharmacies for all counties in the US as of 2014. And we link the data at the CVSA level, which um, are areas that include a county with an urban area of at least 10,000 residents and any surrounding counties in which 25% of the residents commute to the central county for employment. And only CVSAs with a total population of over 100,000 were used for this analysis because the Census Bureau is prohibited from releasing geographic identifiers for uh, individuals living in areas with fewer than that. Um, so this was you know, the most granular geographic unit we could use for this analysis, um, which does limit its generalizability a bit, but about 85% of the US population live in CBSAs with over uh, 100,000 residents. So after eliminating um, observations of individuals who didn't live in those eligible CBSAs or lived in CBSAs that had already had existing tobacco-free pharmacy laws like in California or Massachusetts, uh, the sample consisted of 10,759 daily smokers and 3,055 non-daily smokers. And the outcome we're looking at is the number of cigarettes smoked per day for daily smokers or per smoking day for non-daily smokers. And the exposure is the percentage of all pharmacies in the CBSA that are CVS pharmacies, uh, which we'll call CVS market share from here on out. And we also considered a number of covariates from the um, CPS to US, including age, gender, race and ethnicity, highest level of educational attainment and current income. And we modeled changes in smoking among daily and non-daily smokers separately um, using two different difference and difference uh, model specifications for, for both of these populations. So first we used a continuous difference and difference, which you know, is similar to the standard model, except exposure is measured using a continuous variable that captures intensity of the exposure rather than a binary variable that just measures exposed versus unexposed. Um, so for this, the term we're interested in is the interaction of the indicator for an individual being surveyed in the pre versus post policy period and the continuous measure of CBS market share in their CBSA. We chose this type of model because there wasn't necessarily a theory driven cut point to choose for exposed versus unexposed when we were thinking about CBS market share and we didn't want to choose one arbitrarily. But second, in, in case the policy change had different effects across the distribution of CVS market share, we estimated models using a categorical variable for market share. So for this, we divided market share into thirds and estimated a model comparing individuals in CVSAs in each of the thirds to individuals in CVSAs with no CVS locations. So for this model, we're interested in three different interactions, those of being in the post period with those of being in each of the thirds. And all models used zero truncated negative binomial regression and were weighted by the survey non-response weights. It's also controlled for the covariates mentioned and included state fixed effects to account for you know, statewide policies that include smoking behaviors. Um, and then errors were clustered at the CBSA level. We did a number of things as sensitivity analyses. First, in case CVS presence was 
proxying for some kind of geographic predictor of smoking. The models were estimated excluding individuals in states where CVS had no presence at all. So Colorado, Idaho, and South Dakota. Uh, second, we additionally controlled for the price individuals reported paying for the last pack of cigarettes they purchased because, you know, of course, the price of cigarettes can be predictive of the number of cigarettes smoked per day. But we didn't really want to do this in the main model because a lot of non-daily smokers don't purchase their own cigarettes, um, you know, borrow them off of uh, friends or, or acquaintances um, that might still have been impacted by this policy with like some spillover effects. Um, so we didn't want to eliminate them from the analysis. So uh, that's why this wasn't controlled for in the main analysis, but we certainly want to try it as a sensitivity analysis. Third, uh, in order to see if any variations in policy impact observed between daily smokers and non-daily smokers in the stratified analyses were significant, we estimated the models using the full sample of current smokers and incorporated an indicator for being a daily versus non-daily smoker and then a triple interaction between CVS market share, the indicator for being interviewed before versus after the policy change and an in the indicator for being a daily versus non-daily smoker. Fourth, as a negative control, we estimated the models using Rite Aid market share rather than CVS market share, for which we anticipated seeing no effect. And then we also re-estimated these models using propensity score methods. And this was because we're worried that individuals surveyed in the post-policy period might be different in ways that influenced uh, smoking uh, than those individuals interviewed in the pre-policy period. You know, the, the CPS TUS is designed to be representative uh, when all three of those time points in a wave are combined, but there is no guarantee that each time point in that survey is representative and that individuals surveyed from CBSAs in, say, the first third of market share in the first survey are similar to those sampled from comparable CSAs in the second and third surveys, especially when we limit to daily versus non-daily smokers. And, and indeed, when we separated CBSAs into thirds of CVS market share and looked at covariate balance in the individuals, surveyed before the policy change versus after, uh, we did see some imbalance, um, not for daily smokers or for the full sample, but for non-daily smokers. So we then created more balanced groups in terms of pre versus post policy uh, change interview date within each category of CVS market share using propensity score methods. Um, we tried a lot of different methods here because there's a fair amount of discussion about how best to incorporate survey weights into propensity scores. You know, do weight the regression that generates the propensity score? Do you include the weight as an additional covariate in the regression? Do you leave it out entirely? We tried all of these with then several strategies for matching and weighting you know, for each of them. Um, ultimately, the best strategy that achieved the best covariate balance across all of these categories was generating the propensity scores using survey-weighted regression and then using radius matching using a caliper of 0.2 times the standard deviation of the load propensity score. Um, all the methods we tried helped reduce imbalance, but this combination was the only one able to achieve standardized difference in means below 0.25 for all the covariates. Uh, so we then estimated the models on, on this matched sample. Um, and I will get to the results, but I wanted to see if there's any questions there before we you know, move on. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, that's a great place to pause. I, I will first see if our discussant, Si Shang, has any comments or questions for you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Phillips. That was a great presentation. Um, I think my questions are, I have two questions here. Um, one is, um, the exposure measure. I know you use the market shares of CVS among pharmacies, but I think one relevant alternative uh, measure would be the share of CVS um, among like all the tobacco retailers. So, because you know, if you you think from the perspective of reducing the tobacco retailer densities and the, the CVS spending on tobacco sales uh, to some extent is driving down the tobacco retailer densities. So I don't know if you guys have thought about uh, using alternative measures, you know, instead of market shares of pharmacy, market shares of CVS among total retailers. Yeah, but it's a great point. And, you know, it's even possible that, you know, in, in response to cigarettes being removed from, from pharmacy, from CVS, that, you know, additional tobacco pharma retailers sprung up to, you know, capture that, that market. Um, it's a great point. It's not something we were able to do. Unfortunately, we didn't have data on the rest of, of tobacco retailers in the area, but it, it would be really interesting to certainly see how, how retailers changed it as a response to this policy change. 
Thank you. I also think you know the stratification between non-daily and daily smokers is very important. Um, I'm just wondering if there is any uh, studies or there are any uh, there is any literature regarding where you know uh, smokers of different uh, frequency who smoke at different frequencies uh, purchase in different locations because you know there are survey data out there asking uh, smokers to report where they purchase their cigarettes. I don't know if you've you know, that and they search on like the purchase locations by uh, smoking frequencies. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not aware of, of any literature that has looked at that separately by daily smokers um, versus non-daily smokers. That's not to say it doesn't exist. Um, and that would be really interesting to see. Certainly, you know, as I mentioned, one of the things we thought about is that non-daily smokers often don't purchase their own cigarettes at all, or they borrow them from, you know, people they're with who are, who are smoking. So there is likely probably, you know, differences in where individuals are purchasing based on their smoking habits, but I, I'm not aware of, of any differences. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll stop here because there are Q and A's. Justin, do you wanna take it over? Yeah, great. We have a, a few questions here um, and other people can put their uh, questions in the Q and A panel if they have any. So the first two questions are all lumped together. Did you look at use of nicotine replacement therapy uh, products like nicotine gum um, after the removal, or um, uh, did you happen to look at sales, uh, overall sales within CVS? So for example, if people are no longer getting their cigarettes there, maybe there's uh, other products that they would have been buying there are also being bought elsewhere. Um, and I'm curious if you thought about either of those. Yeah, um, in terms, I'll start with, you know, in terms of other products at CVS that, you know, we were using the survey data, so that wasn't something we were able to look at, but I know there have been some evaluations of, of like, um, CVS profits after the policy change went into effect, and they have, I think, not seen a change in profits or, or a decrease in profits following this, so, um, you know, that's not to say, I, I'm not sure what exactly to make of that, um, not something we were able to look at. Um, and then in terms of nicotine replacement therapy, um, no, we did not, but that's a great next step for this research for sure. And I'm and not aware of anyone else who has looked at that yet. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to use retail sales data to see what sort of, um, if, if there are any spillovers um, or, or, or substitution effects for overall sales. So did you control for state specific linear trends by any chance as a robustness check? No, so this is a huge limitation of the analysis um, that we really only had this one time point of data to use for this, which is you know 2014 to 2015. The survey is administered every three to four years, so we could have incorporated you know data from 2010, but we weren't sure how useful that would be in actually assessing trends. If, you know, we're only measuring um, at one point every every three to four years. So no, we weren't able to include um, any trends going into this. Okay, um, there's another question here about, um, isn't the effect of CVS not selling tobacco contingent on individuals regularly visiting CVS? So wouldn't we expect effects to be concentrated upon perhaps unhealthy people who are picking up um, prescription medications? Yeah, it's a great point. I think, you know, there's, that's a possibility. Um, but I, I think, you know, CVS and these, you know, large scale pharmacies are really frequented by a lot of people. I think estimates estimate suggest it's like we, on average, individuals make about 35 trips to pharmacies every year. So even if you're not necessarily going to pick up uh, medication, I think a lot of us still go to CVS for other things. And um, in terms of how these are set up, I do think it's possible, you know, often if you go, are going to a CVS or a corporate pharmacy to pick up a prescription, you go straight back to the pharmacy, you can pay for it there without even going necessarily to the front of the store where, where cigarettes are located. So I think it's possible to sort of avoid this whole impulse purchasing um, for people who are going straight to the pharmacy for prescriptions. Great. And there's a couple questions about CVS in terms of their uh, smoking or tobacco cessation support. So it's, um, one question is um, whether you looked at their minute clinics and pharmacy, whether they're doing anything more to help users quit, um, which I imagine with your survey data, we're not able to see. And then there's another question about um, how the CVS Health Foundation has a Be Vape Free uh, website to provide campaigns and awareness for youth about not vaping and whether you were able to obtain any data um, about that or, or continuing impacts of CVS Pharmacy's uh, removal of tobacco products. Yeah, I, I, we weren't. Um, 
as you mentioned, you know, we really only use this data. They did, you know, as a result, when they removed tobacco from pharmacies, like really replaced everything with like messaging about quitting and uh, encouraging quitting and, um, to, you know, nicotine replacement therapy type of products. Um, so, you, you know, there, there's that, but, but I think this, uh, I, I, to my knowledge, I haven't seen anyone really dig into, you know, the effect of, of CVS on quit attempts and the like prolonged quit attempts following this. So I think this is definitely like a, a wide open area for, for further research. And uh, one other question here is about in your methodology, do you think you accounted for the proliferation of pharmacy deserts in under-resourced communities to assess the equity impact of um, CVS's policy? No, I, I think we didn't, especially because we are limited to, you know, CBSAs with populations over 100,000. These are the areas that are more likely to have like big box pharmacies. We don't have, we weren't able to look at this among rural populations um, and areas that have, you know, fewer pharmacies, um, pharmacy deserts. So I, I think that's a great point. And certainly this is a limit of the generalizability of the study and looking at rural areas is a huge, you know, next step for this and, and pharmacy deserts. Great. Um, I, I think I'll actually save the last question towards the end because I think it's more of a big picture question. So wh why don't you uh, continue with the, your presentation and we'll come back to questions at the end. Okay, great. Uh, thanks everyone for those questions. Um, so yeah, what did we see? Um, so CVS made up a pretty sizable portion of the pharmacy market in uh, 2014. Across the 292 CVSAs in the sample, CVS market share ranged from zero to about 35% of the pharmacies with a mean of about 11%. And this figure shows the number of CVSAs at each level of CVS market share. So you can you know, see the distribution here. Of course, um, you know, uh, about 47 of the 292 had uh, no CVS locations. And uh, prior to the policy change, daily smokers reported smoking on average 14 cigarettes per day and non-daily smokers reported smoking about four cigarettes per smoking day. Um, uh, and the rest of this table shows a breakdown of the characteristics of daily smokers and non-daily smokers, but non-daily smokers on average were younger, more likely to be of racial and ethnic minority groups, uh, more highly educated and had higher incomes than daily smokers, which is consistent with previous research. And then turning to the results of the model, we didn't find that the policy change was associated with differential changes in the number of cigarettes smoked by daily smokers, neither in the continuous model nor in the categorical model. But both models identified a reduction in cigarette smoke by non-daily smokers following the policy change. So we see you know, a minor but significant reduction in the association of market share with cigarettes smoked following the policy change in the continuous version. And in the categorical model, we actually see some evidence of nonlinearity. So this model shows no differential change among non-daily smokers in CVSAs in the lowest third of CVS market share compared to smokers in, in CVSAs with no CVS presence but significant reductions among non-daily smokers in the CVSAs in that middle category and the highest category compared to those in CVSAs with no CVS locations. And these effect sizes are larger in magnitude than what we observed in the continuous model, suggesting perhaps that CVS has to have a, a substantial footprint in the pharmacy market for the policy change to have an impact and that we're obscuring some of this by assuming a, a constant dose response in the continuous uh, model specification. And the results of the sensitivity analyses for the most part supported the findings of the main models. Um, the results of the continuous model are really consistent in terms of magnitude and significance uh, across all the specifications with as expected, no evidence of an impact when looking at Rite Aid market share. Uh, and the results of the categorical model um, for the highest category of CVS market share are also pretty consistent. Not quite as consistent for the effect we were seeing in that middle uh, third, we see that the results only significant at the 0.1 level when controlling for price and that there was no significant difference observed between daily and non-daily smokers when we modeled it using a triple interaction. So we're a little more cautious in interpreting the findings about that middle category, but certainly continue to see an effect of, that, of the policy change among smokers living in the highest third uh, of CVS market share compared to those living in CVSAs with no CVS locations.
Um, so just to think through this a little more, you know, we see that the removal of, of tobacco products from CVS pharmacies was linked to smoking fewer cigarettes per day among non-daily smokers, particularly in areas with large CVS market share. And while we didn't identify an impact among daily smokers, the impact among non-daily smokers is you know, notable because uh, non-daily smokers are, as I'm sure many people in this audience know well, a, you know, a unique and important group. The well, the overall number of current smokers has declined in recent years, the number of non-daily smokers has actually increased. And this isn't necessarily just daily smokers reducing their smoking and becoming non-daily smokers. Some non-daily smokers are, are newly initiating or transitioning from more intensive smoking, but literature suggests that about half of non-daily smokers are stable in that habit, um, having been smoking non-daily for at least a year. And of those stable smokers, only over 75% have been stable for at least five years. Um, and crucially, non-daily smokers tend to be missed by clinical smoking cessation efforts. So you know, many non-daily smokers don't identify as smokers, and um, they're less likely to be advised by their physicians to quit smoking. Um, for that reason, they, if, if they do decide to quit or cut back, pharmacotherapies designed to counter nicotine withdrawal are, for the most part, untested among non-daily smokers and have unknown effectiveness for non-daily smokers who often don't experience nicotine dependence. Um, and because they have different motivations for smoking and, and different perceptions of the health risks they're facing, they might not be receptive to standard cessation messages. Um, so definitely like a lot to learn about this population, but really any intervention that might um, assist non-daily smokers in reducing their tobacco use, it, it has, you know, unique value. Um, also, you know, important to note that the effects identified in the study are, are pretty modest in magnitude in comparison to those uh, of other tobacco control policies and some other pharmacological and behavioral interventions. Um, but, you know, of course, there's no safe amount of cigarette consumption in uh, you know, reductions in smoking have also been associated with, with future cessation, so even small reductions are, are obviously good news. Um, and it's possible that the effect might have been more substantial if tobacco were removed from all pharmacies rather than only CVS locations, which you know, leads us to think about the fact that other corporate pharmacies and municipalities should, should consider enacting tobacco-free pharmacy policies. Um, you know, this is, we haven't seen other corporate pharmacies follow suit, really. Um, Tobacco is still available in, in Rite Aid and in Walgreens and in places like uh, Dollar Tree and Dollar Store. Um, but uh, we are seeing some movement in terms of municipalities. Um, in, in 2020, I think it was the last time New York State became the first or second state to, to prohibit tobacco sales in pharmacies statewide. So, you know, this is certainly something that's still being considered um, and something that, you know, certainly needs more research as we continue to be having these policy discussions. Um, definitely some important limitations to this work. Uh, as I mentioned, the biggest one really is that we only had one time point before the policy change and, and two time points after. So we weren't able to assess, you know, pre-policy trends at all or be able to incorporate that into the analysis. This, you know, unfortunately is a function of the data. As I mentioned, it's, you know, surveys only conducted every three to four years and we just weren't sure there was utility to including, you know, sporadic three to four year periods before that and how much we could really learn about trends from that. But of course, this means we're making a lot of untested assumptions um, when we estimate these models. It also means we can't look at the long-term effects of the policy change. Um, um, yeah, so we, you know, we really only had the, the six months following, um, following the policy implementation. But the analysis is also restricted to individuals living in CVSAs with populations over 100,000, which again is about 85% of the U.S. population, but really, you know, doesn't, doesn't get at rural areas or um, which might be some areas that have, are, are less likely to have, you know, corporate pharmacies. And then finally, it's very possible that there were store closures or, you know, or changes in, in tobacco retailer density during this period. And we really only had um, a measure of, of store density and, and, um, and CVS locations at, at one time point. Um, and with that, I will say thank you. And I'm looking forward to taking more questions. Okay, thanks. I, I will. Uh, that, that was great. Let's turn it back to our discussant to uh, see if she has questions.
Thank you. That was great. Um, so I, I just uh, did a Google search. Um, there is an article uh, by Kruger et al. published in 2017 in Preventive Medicine. So actually, those authors uh, looked into National Adult Tobacco Survey uh, between 2012 to 2014, and they looked into the um, purchase locations reported by participants. And their results show that the uh, drugstore purchases only account for 5% of all the uh, reported purchase locations. So um, can you, uh, I guess, uh, tell us your thoughts about like whether the effects that you see from your results um, align with what we observe from other surveys, which is, you know, the uh, shares of drugstore sales <laughs> among all total tobacco sales was actually low. So. Do you think your effect size is large or like, you know, in line with what you would expect? Yeah, I think it is like relatively in line with, with what we would expect considering that type of number. I think, you know, we, we did some sort of back of the envelope calculations and these estimates we're seeing, um, you know, make up like, if we, if we use like the estimate from the, the categorical model um, that translates into, you know, about like 0.4% Fewer cigarettes per smoking day among non-daily smokers, um, as, the, as like the you know the quantification of the policy change. So that's like a relatively small reduction. But as you mentioned, only about three to five percent of, of cigarette sales happen in drugstores. So I do think that's you know relatively in line with what we might expect, um, and speaks to you know other policy changes that influence retail sales of tobacco in, in other venues. Um, you know, convenience stores are, are the major venue for, for tobacco sales. Um, thinking about, you know, are there, is there legs to, to policy changes that would influence the, the availability of tobacco in convenience stores as well? We would probably see like a much larger effect. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, another interesting research question that I, uh, I can think of <laughs> getting all this like excellent research is about, um, you know, uh, the purchase location changes post uh, the CVS bans. So it would be nice if we can observe where smokers uh, purchase their cigarettes. If uh, you know they were like previously buying from CVS stores, and then suddenly there is a ban. You know whether they switch to or they go to other stores to purchase cigarettes, or they just you know plan to quit. So um, I think that would be quite interesting. I don't know if there is any data that we can use to answer that type of question. Um, I agree. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not sure. We obviously are seeing in this data, we're seeing total, you know, number of cigarettes smoked per day, regardless of purchase location. So we do see like a little bit of a reduction. Um, so they're not, you know, completely substituting for, uh, you know, or, or our estimates suggest there's not a complete substitution for a different purchase location. But, you know, imagine certainly there is some, and it would be really interesting to see how that has changed, um, you know, as a result of this policy change. Um, as well as like long-term effects of that as well. Yeah, okay. Um, and there is also a question from um, Mike Pisco regarding how you grew people into daily smoking and non-daily smoking. Uh, is it based on baseline or does the person need to be in these groups across all survey time periods? So the individuals are actually only surveyed at one of these time periods. This is, you know, a repeated cross-section uh, type of, of, of model. Um, so at, you know, at each survey wave, they're asked about their current, you know, when they're interviewed, they're asked about their current smoking habits and they report either smoking every day or they report smoking some days. And that's how we group them into these categories. Yeah. So I remember that USCPIs are cross-sectional mostly. And um, I know that they can be linked, but, you know, I rarely see any research using just the, the match data over time. So, yeah. Um, and um, so I think there are two Q&A questions. Um, yeah, just, do you want me to take those? Yeah, please. Sure, thank you. Um, so the first question is whether there's any update on other national pharmacies who have either stopped or planned to stop the sale of cigarette and e-cigarette products. And maybe if you, you alluded to this at the beginning, but also um, jurisdictions that, that ban the sale, it would be, I don't know if you can say anything more about that, um, since, since I, I think my understanding is that's the more common way that um, these restrictions have been uh, coming to force. Yeah, I think it is as well. I haven't heard, uh, you know, any other corporate pharmacies that are doing this. Target, you know, doesn't sell uh, tobacco, but that's not necessarily new. Um, 
But yeah, a lot of the other corporate pharmacies we think about, Rite Aid, Walgreens, they certainly still do, and I haven't heard any news about them stopping. Um, but yes, we are certainly seeing sort of increases in local jurisdictions doing this. Um, at the time of this policy change, it was really just jurisdictions in California and Massachusetts that had, um, you know, had such policies, but it is spreading to other jurisdictions, New York City, and maybe like 2019, and then all of New York State in 2020. Um, I want to say that's the most recent one, to my knowledge, at least, but I, I think that, I think you're right, that sort of is the, the way that this has been spreading, um, these types of policies, which is great because it also, you know, means that it, it's likely to have more of an impact if it's in all in all pharmacies, but CVS, that tobacco is being removed from rather than just CVS locations. Yeah. Um, and is there a particular source or study that shows non-daily smokers are on the rise? Uh, this person says that's fascinating to hear. There is, yeah. This comes from um, work that, it, of course, now it is just escaping me, but I believe it, it's work by Dr. Hendrickson and Dr. Seid, uh, Seidenberg um, that, yeah, has shown that that non-daily smokers are, are, are on the rise, which I agree is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Justin, can I ask one more question? Um, yeah. So I, it just occurs to me, I think, you know, it's, it will be very interesting to see the uh, equity impact of the CVI's uh, sales bans. Because if you think about the, the densities of CVIs, you know, the market shares of CVIs, I would suspect that CVIs has a higher density among uh, in, in those more urban areas. So I say if the spell is very effective in reducing uh, smoking, then probably uh, it may not pro equity because it doesn't really reach the uh, rural populations. Can you? you know, comment on that. <laughs> yeah, there actually has been a little bit of work on this that looked, um, I believe it was at Rhode Island, they looked at sort of where CVS locations were and what their remo the removal of um, tobacco from those locations did to sort of the density of, of tobacco retailers in different neighborhoods. And, and you, exactly, I believe what you're saying is right, is what they found that, you know, this reduced density in higher income areas, but not as much in lower income areas. So, you know, certainly equity issues there as well. So there's a question, th this comes uh, from Mike Pesco, co-organizer, who uh, asked about uh, whether the focus on the number of cigarettes smoked might miss some effect uh, that the policy has had on people smoking at all, and, and what your thoughts are there. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, we, we really picked this outcome because we thought that, you know, a change like this is for the reasons of like, uh, you know, getting at everyone in, across the stages of that, you know, trans theoretical model of change, as well as like we thought that the policy change was probably more likely to impact us in small ways. Maybe like, you know, if you don't see cigarettes at the pharmacy counter, are you really more likely to be like, well, this is it for me, I'm quitting, or are you maybe just less likely to buy cigarettes on that day? So we were really thinking about like, what are some of the small changes we could observe um, as well as some folks are already, we're already working on quit attempts and, and, are, and we're seeing, actually seeing some, some changes. So um, yeah, that was great. And you mentioned that towards the start of your talk that there might be at least a couple of mechanisms here in terms of impulse buys and shifting social norms. Um, it would be interesting to sort of see whether, I, I think you could potentially use other survey data to try to look at whether social norms have shifted people's beliefs about, I guess, the, the harms of smoking or um, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, I, I don't know, it would be interesting to sort of get a little bit more at the, the underlying mechanisms that you proposed here. I don't know if you have further thoughts on which of these might be bigger drivers or other ideas to get at mechanisms. Um, yeah, for, I, I guess salience is another one here, yeah. Definitely, I, I agree. Um, kind of thought about like whether or not there were, you know, surveys that would, get at like perceived normativity or popularity. Um, we weren't really able to identify anything, but like certainly qualitative work would be really interesting uh, in this area to understand how people's thoughts about smoking and, and purchasing habits have changed. Um, yeah. So there's another question that came into the Q&A. It says Walmart is also in low density areas and still continues to sell tobacco products. Uh, oh, I guess this is, I apologize. This is just a comment, not a um, question, but says that, uh, there are uh, chains that sell to minors before. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. that's, you know, also concerning. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I just want to plug in uh, for the International Tobacco Control Project surveys because I know that they collect information on the purchase locations and they also collect you know, longitudinal data. So I don't know if uh, you can look into the purchase locations during the period when there was a CVI sales ban, but you know, definitely you can uh, look into uh, the, the stratification by daily versus non-daily smokers and uh, to look at whether their uh, purchase locations change over time. And that, that probably can back up your a lot of these mechanisms you've been talking about at the beginning of the presentation, which I think is quite important. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. This is, you know, a very blunt project that is, you know, we really can't dig into the mechanisms at all. So yeah, that data would be great. Thank you. Um, I think we will end a little bit early today. I, I, and so I will turn it over to, I guess, uh, Catherine to, to take us out. Thank you, Dr. Phillips, for ending the season of TOPS on such a high note. Thank you also to our moderator, discussant, and audience of 227 people for you joining us today. The next season of TOPS will start on March 18th. Our submission period for TOPS proposals just closed yesterday, and we are in the process of reviewing them. So please keep an eye out for an email from us with additional details about next season's presentation. Have a TOPS notch weekend. Thanks, everyone.